Thank you. Well, it looks like I'm about to start the, 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 the live stream a couple of minutes earlier than I thought, but that's all right. Like I'm about to start it. Got it. It launches automatically after you know they they plug in the um. What am I trying to say? They plug in the the, the yeah it's it's started already. They plug in the 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 information I need to have in order to live stream, mm -hmm. and so you click one button and it's started. But they give you all this other information. Thing and I multiple times I thought. Oh no! <laughs> I need to be doing something, <laughs> and no. In fact, I've already done. <laughs> I did it half an hour early once, and that was not my intention. Ah. Um, so get your mother now to log in, so I can get some some streaming views. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to tell my mom. Uh, she loves. I sent the link around. I, I sent the the stream around. Uh, oh, the link to all my family. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right away. Um. I went to uh, the. I watched the Zoom for the event that was at two fifteen today. That was hosted by Professor Wills. Uh -huh. uh, I, I thought everyone did great presentations there too. Yeah. Fantastic. I didn't get to watch. I was yeah. doing some other thing. I found out though they had like merch there and everything. That like the presenters there got like tote bags and T-shirts and like. Damn free pizza and i was like well what are we <laughs> you know <laughs> hey i didn't know this i guess yeah. i should have um but there's another day tomorrow so i'm just going to try to go to the student center and snag something so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you need pizza um yeah right. tune in right so i sent this to my mom and my sister because I have this fear, like we're going to be it. This is like we're going to be. This is it. <laughs> There's going to be four or five of us and we're <laughs> talking to each other, and it's going to be fine. But you know, yeah. Have a lot of people registered for this Zoom. Fifteen, a grand total of fifteen, and six of you are presenting. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Okay, so I'm going to let Robert in because he's a uh, he's in some ways one of us, um, <laughs> even though he chose not to present today. I can be petulant. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Hi, Professor. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you doing? You chose not to present today, so I I I, I was joking that I can be petulant about that fact. I, I'm teasing. I, I'm teasing. I wanted to, but I'm taking my MCAT on Friday, so I am completely swamped. So I, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'll accept it, though. <laughs> I'll, I'll present at the Clio. Uh, yes. Luncheon. Yeah. So I that should everyone, be that should be fun. Yeah, I hope everyone attends. We're gonna have like some desserts. We're gonna have like sushi platters. So. You know, it's good food to eat. So, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you want people to attend, but you have to be careful. If you tell everyone there's food, you know, then, the, you know, the people will be like, all right, great. And then leave. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, we'll have to let in everyone at one time and then we're going to have to lock the door from the outside. <laughs> yes. Until the event is over. You're going to have to yeah. sit through history students talking about their research for an hour and a half. <laughs> You're going to pay for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Robert, are you going to be there in person? I'm going to try. All right. Yeah. I'm actually yeah. going to try to be there in person for that one. I'm hoping. I mean, I have to be there to get the sushi, so. Right. I mean, it feels like, it'll feel like a major reveal to me. I've never seen you in person, so. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen most people in person either, so it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. going to be like a major reveal for me as well. Not just one major yeah. reveal, but hundreds of major reveals. <laughs> That'll be the real attraction instead of the food is like see Robert in person, you know. <laughs> 
Let's put that out on social media. Robert is coming. <laughs> the whole thing. By the way, we're also going to have to of our imagination. We're going to have to like. Uh, I don't know if we can count the elections that we held like back in February as elections for next year. I'm I'm just going to count those for next year and keep everyone as is and submit that for next year. Unless well, you know, I mean, I mean, Rachel's going to be graduating. Uh, Wait, she's graduating so, this year. Yeah, she's gonna be graduating. So uh, she's in the same year as me. I thought she was a junior. No, she she's graduating. Yeah. Really? Wow. So we might need to change it up. I was thinking of running for for president. Okay. I mean. <laughs> a muted response. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm more than happy staying as treasurer. Well, I figured your your ambitions were in student government. That seems to be where you're seem to be rising. Well, we're all, my ambitions are just I don't know. Hey guys, we'll What's talk up? about it later. <laughs> welcome. welcome. Hey, welcome. thanks. <laughs> nice to see you. Glad you're here. <laughs> I've been joking with folks that like it could be us. <laughs> it oh, could yeah. be us, and that would be fine. But I don't really think so. I think that um, uh, the dean uh, registered for the event, and his assistant did, and and I was telling B that that um, in fact there is money on the line here. There's. Uh, Professor King is coming. They're, they're giving out awards of a thousand bucks for the f top ten presentations. So knock it out of the park, guys. That's what I want. I want Dang. you to, to, to nail it. Yeah, they're gonna also send like a few members of the I'm gonna say faculty, students, administration within the School of Humanities and Social Sciences to be like these judges that they send out to write these feedback uh, reports to the dean to help make those decisions. So, fantastic. Professor King is here with us. Uh, Professor Brodsky is here. And and Levi, make sure Levi? I put. Say again. I, I think it was cutting David off. <laughs> Uh, I just want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. It's Levi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it's Alyssa Wright. That's easy enough for my tongue. I can manage that. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and everybody else, I, I, I think I know uh, so far. I do want to say, even though we're, we're being all chatty and stuff, we are streaming live um, just because I started the thing a little early. It is being recorded on the Brooklyn College website, and it'll be permanently there as part of the, hit, the HSS contribution to the, to the uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the, 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 <laughs> the BC YouTube. Um, so you can get your parents to watch it later or whatever. And it's a resume line, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to make sure to write it down and, and put this on your, on your CV um, as, a, as a presentation that you did. It's a good thing. Plus, it forces us to think about the project a little more deeply, you know. It's so hard to, to get it down to just a few minutes, right? I mean, you've spent hours and hours and days and days on it. And then figuring out, like, how do you articulate what you were up to and what you got out of it? That's a real skill. It's a good thing. Yeah, it, it's helped me recently with my, because uh, I'm still finishing up my independent project. It's helped me. Uh, towards the conclusion of like, all right, so what am I talking about here, you know? That's right, what, what, yeah. what did you accomplish? That's right. Mm -hmm. Professor Nancy is here, Professor Godlib, That's it. this is terrific. I'll wait a couple of more minutes just because I have, I was forced to remember this morning that people kind of stroll in right around the hour, but often a minute or two late. Um, Instead of coming five minutes early, like we all do when we're in person, uh, to get your seat. Professor Nancia, 
you know, as a scholar, I like to do the short presentations first, write the abstract, then do the presentation. Then I'm like, oh, I can write a chapter or a paper out of this. And then I can write a book, right? It's a skill. It's a, you know, to, to figure out how to, how to condense it and then, and then build it out. James is here and so is uh, Dean Gould. This is wonderful, folks. And th I, I am grateful for your for all of, to all of you for taking a slice out of your evening um, to listen to our fabulous students. We had a, a good day of presentations in the history department. Um, and tomorrow, um, I'm going to share my screen here for a moment as a means of um, uh, announcing some of this stuff. I'm, I am actually going to make Professor Mancia a co-host so that she can help me do the stuff. Um, and I've got a co-host. There we go. So I'm sharing my screen, and I just want to say welcome to everyone um, to the evening session of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences Student Expo for Monday, April 25th. Um, this is the Humanities and, uh, and History Student Research Showcase, part of two days' worth of events um, arranged and created by our, our dean, and for which we are grateful. Um, this is the web page for the Student Expo, and I'm going to drop into the chat the entire schedule for events, um, which take up, pick up again tomorrow. Uh, here we go. And I am hopeful that you will uh, have, have some time to, to join tomorrow um, as Professor Mancia's class um, a, a, takes on asking questions about historical and religious experience at 10 a.m. in room 1112 Boylan. Professor Mancia, do you want to say anything about what you're up to for tomorrow? You don't have to, but... Uh, well, just that it's going to be a different kind of event. So there's just going to be um, little groups of students who are going to lead us through conversations in response to questions about religious experience. So it should be fun. You can bring your thinking caps, as it were. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you very much. I'm going to drop that into the chat um, so you can copy it if you wish to. Um, and then uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, tell folks that we are having an alumni careers event tomorrow, sorry, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. On the 27th, we've got four wonderful history alumni who are, will come back and talk to us about the way they have taken their undergraduate history degrees and moved it into their professional lives. For each one of them, uh, history is a very much, um, very much a live part of their working, working careers. And they're, they're wonderful folks, and I hope you'll come um, uh, and, uh, and listen to them. I'm going to drop the Zoom registration into the chat here. So please do come, especially if you're one of my students, right? You know, everybody needs a job. Here we go uh, 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 talking to people who um, have had the experience of doing it. I also uh, want to remind folks that the best way to follow the kinds of events that Professor Mancia and I and others in the department plan um, is by following us on social media. We have a pretty lively um, social media presence. The goal, of course, is just to communicate with you guys about what we're doing. Um, and so that's just our set of um, links. Uh, so I hope you'll, you'll follow us. Um, and, and as we go forward, this is a remark directed at our presenters. I want to remind you guys to um, share the sound if you are um, playing a clip for some, or something like that for us to hear. It's in the bottom left-hand corner of the share screen window. Um, and with that, I would like to take this opportunity once again to say thank you to my collaborators in uh, philosophy and in Judaic studies for offering us your students to participate with ours. The first student I'd like to introduce is Levi Sater. Um, his paper is entitled The Hopeful Capacity of Octopuses. Uh, Levi is majoring in uh, psychology with a minor in neuroscience. His philosophical work reflects on his scholastic focus. In this work, he considers whether the experience of hope is solely within the purview of humans, or if invertebrates with complex nervous systems also have the capacity to hope. Levi, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share. Oh, can I share my screen? Yes, um, oh. I should have arranged that. Get it. 
down here. Fantastic. Uh, all right, so you can just see the screen, yeah? Great, yes, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, without further ado, let's talk about it. So we're going to talk about Octopus Experience soon, but first let's take a moment to set things up. Sensory experience, mind, and emotions can all be understood to be developed gradually over the course of evolution for functional purposes, uh, which aid the survival of organisms. Sensation is what allows an organism to perceive its environment and its internal states. Mind is not something that exists outside of experience, but it's inextricably tied to the interaction of sensation with the environment and the organism's body. So as an organism senses their environment, the information is incorporated into the body of the organism, allowing it to orient more effectively with this environment. And emotions are mental states that occur because of neurophysiological changes within the uh, organism. So they serve the function of orienting it and adapting its behavior to succeed within the environment. Um, they do this by inhibiting behaviors and making relevant behaviors more likely. So for example, if I get angry, uh, it's easier to hit someone than it is to talk to them about it very carefully. Um, sensory, emotional, uh, sensory and emotional experience, as well as mind, are not just experienced by human beings. In fact, they appear to exist along a continuum where organisms have more or less complex uh, experiential lives. So what are octopuses? First off, yes, it is octopuses, not octopi. Uh, octopi is the Latin root, uh, would infer that it was a Latin root, but it's actually a Greek root, uh, hence octopuses. Um, they are predator mollusks. So essentially they're clams that got rid of their shell and developed eight arms. Um, and they're kind of in the middle of the food chain. So there's a lot of things that prey on them uh, because they're this great little packet of protein, but they also uh, have, they also, you know, uh, sustain themselves through predation. So they do this by using their intellect, perception, and camouflage abilities to aid them. So their sensory abilities, uh, specifically their eyes, are actually really effective, and they're similar to our eyes, even though they were developed on a completely independent evolutionary tract, which is pretty crazy. Um, but they're so good that they can even, you know, recognize people, for example but their best sense is actually a chemical sensation, which happens through their suckers. So each of these on each arm is about 280 suckers, which has 10,000 receptors per sucker, um, allowing it to taste its environment, uh, which is especially helpful in an aquatic life. Um, but they don't just use that to, uh, to live, they use a really incredible intelligence. Um, to use different ways to hunt animals. They hunt like lobster, crab, uh, fish, and clams, all of which requiring very different techniques. And they avoid being eaten by many different animals uh, using by running away and also camouflage uh, among others and, and just pure trickery. Um, but they're so intelligent that they actually play as well. So when bored, even in the wild or in experimental conditions, uh, they will play. So in an experimental condition, uh, when they're given a novel object, like a ball, they will first bring it to their mouth, um, trying to eat it maybe. Uh, when that doesn't work, then they start passing it between their arms. And they'll do this pretty regularly, or they'll, they'll uh, move it around uh, as, if, as, as if they're playing, and they'll, they'll come back to this uh, multiple times without trying to eat it anymore. So that shows that they, they do, in fact, play. And one thing that's really interesting is they don't have a a lot of control over their uh, coloring. So they use it for camouflage, right? So their, their skin can change color really quickly, um, but it's because it has photorecept there's photoreceptors within their skin that does it. So it's not something that's controlled from their central nervous system as much. It's more something that just automatically happens. And one thing that's really cool about that is that we can infer their emotional life from their color changes. So when an octopus um, is acting aggressively and seems to be getting angry, it then turns this like dark kind of rusty red color um, pretty consistently uh, throughout octopus experience. And also when they're sleeping, 
they'll be in this kind of like gray, light brown coloring, uh, which shows a resting state. Um, but then they enter what seems like REM uh, sleep. And so they'll go through this huge like color variation, uh, which is really beautiful to see. And I recommend uh, people should watch it if they can. But I wouldn't just be saying that they have an emotional life based on their color changes. So octopuses have been found to be sentient. And this means that they have the capacity to have feelings such as pain, pleasure, hunger, thirst, warmth, joy, comfort, and excitement. And sentience is actually a scientific designation. So uh, Birch and colleagues in 2021 actually went through about 300 different empirical articles and found that they have the ability to experience all of these emotional states. Um, additionally, they actually appear to have distinct personalities, so much so that the Seattle Aquarium has developed a personality text for the octopuses within their care. Uh, and this may seem weird at first, but personality is a set of consistent behaviors, cognitions, and emotions, uh, emotional patterns. So considering the intellectual capacity of the octopus mind, their consistent behaviors, and their emotional expressiveness, it seems necessary to conclude that they do, in fact, have personalities. And so the big question then is, can they experience hope? Well, hope is both a cognitive and emotional process within the mind. So it's experienced when an individual identifies a preferred future goal and then uses agency and pathways to accomplish that goal. And agency is, uh, learn is created through the learning process. So one uh, learns they're capable of influencing their environment and meeting their needs uh, through multiple experiences. And then pathways thinking is the development of multiple ways of accomplishing a goal in spite of barriers. So within the psychological literature, the emotional aspect of hope uh, is experienced more fully as one sees themselves higher in agency and pathways thinking. And importantly, hope allows one to persist in spite of barriers and consider different pathways around them to reach the goal. So if one accepts that consciousness is on a continuum, then hope is able to be experienced by a sufficiently complex organism. Uh, they must be able to have future goals and learn that they can manipulate the world through experience and utilize a number of ways to accomplish those goals. So some examples of this with octopuses. In the documentary, My Octopus Teacher, which many people have seen, uh, it was, came out uh, in tw uh, two years ago, there's a scene where the octopus is trying to avoid being eaten by a shark. And first it tries to use camouflage to avoid the shark. The shark keeps coming at it. So it ends up trying to run away. Uh, this also doesn't work. So it actually creates this complex kind of shield around it uh, from objects in its, in its environment, which the shark still is coming at it. Uh, so it ends up dropping this and ends up riding on the back of this shark, which is uh, pretty exceptional and I don't think happens often, but the fact that it did happen at all, right? And it was caught on, caught on film, which is awesome. So what is the preferred goal? Not to be eaten. Uh, the octopus uses its, uh, itself as an agent to activate many different pathways to accomplish that goal. Another example is at the New England Aquarium. There was an octopus uh, that was in a tank near some flounder. Uh, and the aquarium was, was getting kind of upset because the flounder kept disappearing from the, the flounder uh, tank. And they looked back at the footage and it turned out the octopus would wait until everyone had left for the night. And then it would come out of its tank, go over to the flounder tank, eat one and then go back into its, into its tank, uh, showing that, so its preferred goal was to have a tasty snack. Uh, it used pathways thinking, right? So it, it waited to implement this goal multiple times to accomplish it. Um, and it was an agent without, uh, throughout. And, you know, finally, octopuses are known to be escape artists. Uh, anyone who works with them uh, talks about the fact that like, if you have them in a space, they seem like they're totally fine. The minute you turn their back, they're going to be gone. They'll be somewhere else. Um, just showing that they, you know, um, that they have these preferred goals that they're able to uh, implement. So if octopuses are capable of future goal-oriented thinking, they're capable of having an emotional experience, then do octopuses have the capacity for hope? I would argue yes. Is it going to be experienced exactly like it's experienced by human beings? No. But that's true of the differences between human beings as well. The experience of hope is invariably tied to the life experience of the organism. 
So an octopus can feel pain, joy, and fear, uh, which is shown by the fact that it's been categorized as sentient. But the fact that they can engage with future-oriented thinking and experience around them, uh, emotions around them, means that they have the capacities for hope. But what are the implications of this? If one agrees that consciousness and sentience are arrived at gradually, and different organisms have more or less of it, then and that there isn't one specific point where the lights turn on, then doesn't that mean that we have to use a term that holds space for non-human organisms that have complex intelligences and social lives? We do this with vulnerable human beings. Uh, vulnerable human beings who have reduced agency are often held as moral patients. So this means that they're given rights which recognize the responsibility of moral agents, such as us, to treat them with concern for their well-being. However, globally, octopuses are not recognized as moral patients. In fact, uh, they're commonly eaten. They're enjoyed fried, boiled, and even eaten alive. So considering octopuses have the capacity for hope, it just seems wrong to treat them that way. And I believe it's time that humanity's moral circle expands to reflect the capacities of experience within organisms that share our world. So organisms should be given protect, uh, octopuses specifically should be given protections which are reflective of the vibrancy of their complex intellectual and emotional lives. And with that, uh, here are my references. And I wanna say a major thank you to uh, Jennifer Mather and Peter Godfrey Smith, whose exper uh, experimental work and philosophical work greatly influenced this project. And also uh, Professor Gottlieb, thank you for dealing with this project uh, through this whole process. Uh, it's been a great time. Wow, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> wonderful and, uh, and, uh, and, and eye-opening in every sense. Um, I, there is a little time for, for Q&A, so I thank you uh, for that. And I would love to have um, folks take the opportunity to unmute themselves and ask Levi a question or two, since we, I think, do have time um, in, our, uh, in our presentation schedule. Um, are there some questions as follow-up? Well, I'll, I'll start with one. Oh, please, uh, Professor Mancia, I'd like you to take the floor. Hi, Levi, I thought that was fantastic. Um, I have a question that might be a question that leads you to other things if you haven't done it already, but I'm interested in how octopuses are perceived differently, maybe in different cultures. Um, maybe if you haven't even done cultural research specifically, right? If you've been looking at a lot of psychology papers, right? Or philosophy of animal rights and stuff, is there something about the perspective of the psychologist or the sociologist or whoever you're working on, right? The animal rights activist that indicates that the perception of octopuses is different for different people, different contexts, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked specifically at the cultural context. Um, octopus research is, is fairly recent, to be honest, um, partially because they're really difficult to actually experimentally test um, because of their intellect. Um, however, I would say, so the sentience was a, re was a really big deal. Uh, that designation in 2021 was a really big deal. And it was a, a combination of, of many, many years worth of work. Um, and there are uh, actually octopus farms, which are currently being um, proposed uh, to deal with, with, with food shortages, right? So people want to be able to have their octopus, uh, you know, like for example, in Spain, uh, there's there's a big farm that they're trying to like make happen. And so there's a lot of people that are currently arguing, look, like we know that they have this vibrant experience. Uh, this is wrong. But the thing is that octopuses um, are invertebrates and they live fairly solitary lives. And so it's really hard to empathize with that, I think, uh, more so even than, you know, empathizing with with other animals like uh, like pigs or cows, for example, right? Like pigs have really... In Incredible uh, intellectual lives as well. So that's what I'd say to that. <laughs> Professor Gottlieb. Yeah, Levi, great job. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you a question that I've asked you over the last few months. Why hope as sort of the defining emotion that would, that should, I guess you think, would shift people from looking at octopuses one way versus another? Yeah, so I think hope 
is an emotion that we attribute to agentic thinking um, and, and agents in general, right? So it allows the octopus to be to, to kind of be taken from just um, experiencing fear or anger or, or some of these more basic emotions and to experience something that is um, indicative of, of moral agency, right? Like less so than uh, we have the capacity to experience as human beings, but still one in which they have these preferred outcomes. They have these stable um, uh, personalities, right? That, that uh, so yeah, essentially what, what hope allows us to do is it allows us to consider them as moral agents in a very rudimentary level, but which then uh, brings them into, makes them seem more, um, it, it makes their moral patienthood seem more important, I think. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I would like to defer additional questions as follow-up until uh, all of our presenters have had the opportunity. I want to say thank you to Levi very, very much. Um, I, en I enjoyed that. It's uh, one of the pleasures of, of doing this kind of stuff is, is the evening of learning for all of us. I'd like to next introduce Alyssa Rhodes. Um, Alyssa was born, oh, uh, let's make Alyssa a co-host. Uh, if, if Professor Mancy would do that for me, I would be grateful. Alyssa was born and, and raised in northern Indiana, surrounded by her mother's flower beds and the neighbor's corn and bean fields. After moving to New York a few years ago and working as a medical receptionist, she decided to major in Judaic studies at Brooklyn College, despite having no Jewish background. Alyssa has recently discovered that there was once a Jewish community in her own hometown, and is currently working on reconstructing this fascinating history and making it visible again. The title of Alyssa's paper is Moises Sabbath Chicken, what the story of one chicken reveals about Jewish life in a small town in small town Indiana. Uh, Alyssa, please. The stage is yours. All right, thank you. Um, so let me um, share my screen. I have some slides here. Um, all right. Are people seeing my screen? Okay. Yes, you probably couldn't hear. <laughs> okay, no, I couldn't hear. Um, all right, so let me move some of you guys to the side. Okay, so it's all good. All right, so yes, the title of my presentation is Mosey Sabbath's Chicken what the story of one chicken reveals about Jewish life in small town, Indiana. Um, so I myself am from Indiana and I do not have any Jewish background. And this is kind of, I'm gonna share a little bit about how I discovered uh, the story of like the Jewish story in my own hometown. And it was through this particular story about a chicken, which I'm gonna get to. Um, so first of all, I had, well, for those of you who maybe don't know where Indiana is <laughs> on the US map, because <laughs> who would know that, um, I've highlighted it in red. And also I'm showing you where, uh, where Goshen comes in uh, Indiana. My, my particular hometown is Goshen, Indiana, and it's um, indicated by the star there. So first of all, um, Two years ago, I picked up this book and it's written by my great grandfather. And it's kind of, it's a memoir of sorts. It has a lot of short stories of his life growing up in Indiana. And I hadn't read it for so long because I thought it looked a little boring as like, but um, I discovered that it's not boring at all. And uh, it's actually what helped me discover that there was even a Jewish presence in Goshen. Um, and it's kind of ironic because I didn't, I, I was from Indiana, came to New York and didn't even realize that there was like this Jewish story until two years into my um, college experience. So uh, anyway, here we go. I'm actually gonna read this story from the book and uh, just a little bit of background. There had been a, uh, a store owner, a Jewish store owner in Wakarusa. And so my, this, I first learned of this in, in my great grandfather's book. His name was Moses Wolfberg. Wakarusa is about 12 miles outside of Goshen. 
Um, and so here I was reading this story and like not real and totally shocked to like be seeing Jewish names um, showing up from my hometown. So uh, here's the story of the chicken and hopefully it didn't have the capacity to hope. <laughs> um, so Mosey, as they called Moses Wolfberg, did not go to Goshen very often. So he would send a chicken for the rabbi to dress to two men who had a Friday pedal route. One day the men were halfway home when they noticed Mosey's chicken still in the spring wagon. One of them said, oh, I can dress it as good as the rabbi. They delivered it to Mosey in good shape and he didn't know the difference. For whatever reason though, the next week, Mosey went to Goshen himself. Arriving at the rabbi's house, he heard, you didn't send me a chicken last week. It was said that Mosey never again asked the two peddlers to take a chicken to the rabbi. So that's the story. And this was also the first time that I was hearing that there was a rabbi in Goshen. And so uh, what was what was interesting to me is that um, it was through my great grandfather that I'm that I'm learning about Goshen, like our Jewish business presence and also Jewish religious presence. And so those are the two uh, things that I'm going to focus on in this presentation, although my my actual paper goes much deeper than that. Um, so through newspaper archives and ancestry.com, I uh, this, that, those were my sources for digging up um, all the information that I learned. So Goshen was established in 1831, and there was already a, a visible Jewish presence by the 1850s. Um, these Jews had a, a mix of Eastern European and German Jewish backgrounds. Um, the majority of the community actually um, were pretty traditional and orthodox. Um, and they did form a synagogue, which I'm going to talk about a, a, in a little bit. And also the majority of the pioneer merchants who, who moved into Goshen, they had started out uh, as peddlers. Not all of them peddled in Goshen, but they would have peddled um, as new immigrants to, in New York. Um, some of them filtered down through like Detroit and Chicago. That's kind of where uh, most of these immigrants were coming through. That was their journey. Um, and then I also discovered that uh, the community was, was, was very much made up of family groups, which is very common for, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the migration patterns, uh, chain migration, that's what I want. <laughs> uh, so I noticed that there were in particular two family groups um, that formed the core of the community. And I'll, I'll show you a, a family tree in a minute. Uh, just to give you an idea of numbers, uh, Goshen's Jewish population uh, from 1878 to 1927. Uh, so we have 125, jumped to 139 by 1907. And then there was a major uh, decline uh, from the turn of the century uh, until like 1927, although there were still Jews in Goshen like up until the 1990s. Um, so anyway, just to give you an idea of numbers. So I've noticed that there is like three uh, kind of spheres of Jewish presence uh, in the area. And it was like a business networks, there was a social net networks going on and also religious networks. And they were all intertwined, of course. And uh, one thing that I've kind of been picking up on just like from reading so much, so many archives, newspaper archives been great, um, is that family was actually really the central um, energizing source for all of these network spheres. And so it's really kind of, and I, I'm, I'm in my paper, I'm talking about how family is shaping each of these spheres and how it, it really connects them all together. Um, so the first, this is just one example of a family cluster that I've discovered in Goshen. And I didn't even discover it right away because um, these are all siblings that ended up moving to Goshen with their families. And the first, the first one, the brother, Nathan, he moved to Goshen in 1866, and his sisters came later um, as already married women. And I didn't realize 
that their husbands were related to Nathan, oops, Nathan Kaminsky through marriage until I read his obituary. And then I was seeing all these like Mrs. Aaron Cohen, Mrs. Levi Songer, Mrs. Meyer Dombuski. And I was like, oh, these are all uh, merchants as well. And so it's really like, like, understanding the family ties really enriches my understanding of of the of the other spheres that I pointed out so um, this is just a great example of kind of that invisible family tie so family and business of course we're very interconnected this is um, an advertisement from 1877 and it's, and it's showing, I really like this one because it shows that uh, that store ownership and partnerships were constantly changing. Um, so this, this particular store had been known as Cohen, Kaminsky and Co. So it's Nathan, Co Nathan Kaminsky and his brother-in-law, Aaron Cohen, and it eventually changed hands to Aaron Cohen and his nephew, actually, Harris Dembuski. Um, here's another very blurry, but really great picture from Goshen's Main Street. Um, you can see some more uh, Jewish owned storefronts here. Um, Katz and Goldstein were brothers-in-law. And uh, next slide. Okay, this is another really interesting family business connection again. Um, this is from the 1880 census. And we have a, uh, uh, is a clothing store owner, his name is Samuel Meyer. And you can see that at the bottom that he had three men that were boarding with them and they were, they were identified as clerks. And so I'm assuming they all were clerking for Samuel Meyer and his business. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, this Abe Katz, uh, age 28, and then you see a Sarah, daughter age seven age 18 there they must have uh formed a a love interest or at least i hope so because they ended up getting married <laughs> uh and then abe katz eventually opened up his own store and it's just really interesting to kind of see the 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 connections and then and then the growth and the branching out so here again is a picture from main street and you can see the the cats uh, clothiers store. Um, so that's Abe Katz. And my great grandfather actually mentions him in his book. He liked to shop for his coats and suits at Abe from Abe Katz, and he said he was a very nice old man. So, <laughs> um, and then this, um, if, if if I go like too far over time, somebody can just kind of let me know because I uh, haven't been paying attention to the time. So um, another interesting thing I discovered about Goshen's business community was their expansion out from Goshen. So uh, I already mentioned our friend Mos Moses Wolfberg. He uh, had his start in Goshen. He had been a pack peddler. Then he was a horse and wagon peddler, opened up his own store, his own store, and then moved out from Goshen. And we have similar things happening um, by these arrows indicated here, but they still kind of are maintaining ties and connections. Um, and I'm gonna skip this one actually. So this is um, some great photos that I found from newspaper. Uh, here's our friend Moses Wolfberg and his son, Louis and Louis's son-in-law, Larry. And all three of them took turns um, uh, running the store in Wakarusa. And the store went out of business uh, by at, in uh, 1983. So that was the, the life of the store. Um, so next I'm, talk, I'm gonna focus on like to, uh, family and religion. And here's a picture of the synagogue in Goshen. Uh, so, the, they formed a congregation in 1876, and for four years, they did not have a leader, um, any sort of rabbi, um, or at least no regular rabbi. They did have some people to kind of fill in for a year at a time. 
But the interesting thing to me was the, uh, the synagogue offices. And this is the first, uh, the first time that they organized the synagogue offices. And you can see, I've tried to highlight um, the different family clusters. So we have the Kaminsky family. Uh, so it's Nathan and his brother-in-law and then the Samuel Meyer family, uh, his brother, and then his son-in-law, Abe Katz. So um, you can definitely see that these, these family clusters were kind of the ones who were involved also in the synagogue life. Although there were plenty of other um, not so committed or not so religious uh, Jewish merchants in Goshen as well. But um, yes. Two, two, two more minutes. Okay, okay, I'll try to go fast. Um, all right, so this just kind of shows the progression of the of their synagogue, and they did some some facelifts to it. Um, in 1932, it it closed down actually, and they, it uh, was turned into a church. So um, the synagogue, the building, they actually moved the entire building uh, from one street corner to the next, where they mostly lived. Uh, this is a picture of their rabbi that they eventually got in. Um, so one interesting thing for me is just seeing the, the imprint that, that this community still has in Goshen. Um, there, here's a building that has a uh, Dimbus, Dimbusky name on the, on the front. Um, this is the current state of the synagogue, which is now a church. Uh, so it's still, still there, but most people have no idea uh, that it used to be a synagogue. Uh, most people have no idea there were Jews in Goshen at one point. So. Uh, this is um, Moses Wolfberg's storefront in Mokarusa. Uh, the downtown area was sort of revamped kind of in his spirit, in his name. Um, and then finally, uh, there, this is the Jewish cemetery that I, of course, didn't know existed until uh, a year ago. So um, anyway, there's still like lots of stories to be unearthed and I, I just have found it a really fascinating journey for me personally, um, just discovering this like remnant of Jewish visibility in my own hometown. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Uh, it it's lovely to hear about uh, parts of the world that I know and uh, to, to know that people are uncovering the past in those, in those spaces and that you can do it from New York is, is also pretty amazing. I'd like to open the floor for a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, would anyone care to, uh, to follow up with Alyssa and, and, uh, and ask something? Please do feel free to unmute yourself. I have a question. Um, thank you for your presentation. It does sound like there's a lot more there. Um, I've said this in an earlier presentation today. One of the things that I find really wonderful about Brooklyn College is the way that so many students find themselves studying identities and groups of people that they don't identify with themselves. So I'm curious what you would say to someone who might say, you know, to another student who might say, well, why would I study Judaic studies? I'm not Jewish. Um, and then the corollary to that is I'm curious what the people in your hometown have to say, as I'm sure you've brought some of this history back to your family in your hometown. Yeah. So your first question, what, what would I say to somebody who doesn't have background who would be interested in, in studying Judaic studies or would ask me why. Um, I guess like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Cause like for me, I, that's just kind of where my interests happen to be. Um, and so I can like answer that for myself personally, but yeah, I don't know. Like I'd say, I just tell people to follow what's, what's interesting for you. Um, you can answer it for you personally, how it's enriched you. Yeah, so um, so I think initially, like my interest in um, like Jewish culture, history, that sort of thing kind of come from like my background as a as Christian. Um, and so just like I'd always been interested in kind of like, I don't know, Jewish roots of of my faith and things like that. And so um, I guess like that's like my personal reason um, or initially that would have been kind of what was initially prompting me. Um, and then your second question, 
Oh, home as far as like bringing it back to my hometown. Yeah, I think people like people are super super interested in this like hidden history. Um, and I've actually connected with some people in Goshen who um, have like Jewish background, but but they themselves like it was kind of lost to them. And so there's there are people in Goshen who are kind of in, also interested in the same thing, and it's kind of really fun to connect with them and um, hopefully do some future work with them too. So, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, I'm I'm grateful for as I say the willingness to bring this hidden history to the surface. Um, our next presenter um, is uh, Oswald B. B. Oswald Beregovich, Beregovich, excuse me, I'm going to mispronounce everything, um, uh, a queer non-binary senior whose project centers around queer people's stories of isolation and how they've been able to cope in the pandemic. The project is an oral history and photography project that seeks to create a collection of solidarity for other queer people and, how, and show the importance of the image as it connects to oral history. For this presentation, they'll be discussing the architecture of their thesis and as an ongoing project, and they're still collecting and analyzing. B, the floor is yours. I'm going to make you a co-host. Thank you, Professor. So just one second while I find my presentation. Okay. Um, thank you, Preston Napoli. Preston Napoli is my um, advisor. This is my thesis project. Um, and yeah, it's uh, definitely a work in progress. Um, I'm working on analyzing the oral histories I've collected now and a lot of the photos for the photo elicitation part, which I'll get into, um, but it's definitely still ongoing and not everything has been collected. So for this, I will just be talking about the architecture and my processes um, for the project. So let's get started. Okay, so for my thesis, I did an oral history and photography project called Queer People in Isolation. I wanted to document queer people's experiences of isolation and how they could how they cope beyond what is commonly shown in pop culture. My intention for this project was to create an oral history collection of queer people's stories that would hopefully serve as a means of solidarity for other queer people. And as a point of research at the start of the project, I hypothesized that younger queer people would have more accounts of internal isolation and the older generation would be more physically isolated. I made these hypotheses through the lens of growing up with the internet. I started conducting oral histories, restricting interviewee participation to people aged 18 to 25 and 55 and older to try to get as much generational separation as possible. Uh, the interviews also had to be from New York City or from the boroughs at some point during the duration of the project uh, to be able to make photos of them while being as COVID safe as possible. Each interviewee had to sign a consent form and deed of gift that permitted me to use their interview materials, which included their interview audio and video recordings, their transcripts submitted and made photographs for this project and put them in the public domain. Sorry about that. However, consent is always ongoing, and if for whatever reason an interviewee decided to rescind their consent, it would be done immediately. Um, I separated my thesis paper into four parts, which are knowing, seeing, doing, and learning. The knowing section refers to some oral history theory that I use to inform why I would use oral history as opposed to any other historical practice. The seeing section is about how the image is connected to oral history and the theory behind the two practices connections, uh, connection, excuse me. Um, in the doing section, I describe the physical practice of conducting oral histories, especially the tools and techniques that I used in my own interviews. And finally, in the learning section, I analyze the interviews and reflect on the process of this project. So the oral history theory that I touch on is the seven components described in Lynn Abrams oral history theory. Those components are orality, narrative, performance, subjectivity, memory, mutability, and collaboration. To sum it up, these components explain that there's more to an oral history than just a story being told. There's a lot of information that you can get from the verbal and physical unconscious and conscious decisions a narrator makes. For example, their vernacular, their cadence, and their body language can inform the oral historian about their background um, or culture and their personality. The components also distinguish oral history as a unique historical practice because it actively involves its living 
human being into the process of historical documentation, as well as documenting their memories with the emotion, reflection, and commentary that comes along with it. The oral historian and narrator have to work together to document history, which is most, if not which is something most, if not all, pra other practices don't do. Uh, in regards to photography's relationship with oral history, I focused on three things: that oral history cannot exist without the image. Um, the practice of photo elicitation, and the purpose of photographing an interviewee. Beyond any physical photographs or visual aid, oral history's most fundamental visual exists in the mental recreation of a story. To understand someone's experience, you have to imagine it for yourself, otherwise there will be a disconnect. How the narrator presents themselves to the oral historian is another form of imagery. How animated they get, how they react to what they say or a question that they're asked, those are all important to getting the full picture, no pun intended. Pun intended. Then there's the introduction of a visual aid, uh, usually in the form of a photograph, but it could be a drawing or a video or something similar. This is the practice of photo elicitation, which is the insertion of typically a photograph into an interview to generate deeper memory. And photo elicitation would also serve as the bridge between an oral history and the narrator's current image. So finally, I decided to make photographs of the interviewees as they are now. My thinking behind that was to put a modern face to the experiences that the narrators were telling me, rather than rely solely on what they looked like from the past. These would be the images of people that were made by their experiences. So the several techniques that I used in my interviews are all pretty simple to do. It was just about getting into the habit of reinforcing them. The five general practices I outlined were coming prepared, getting consent before, during, and after the interview, embracing silence, the, uh, to me, being adaptable and asking certain types of questions. So in terms of coming prepared, it's important to do as much research as possible before an interview. For something like a life history interview, that can be kind of hard if they're not well known, but most importantly is, sorry, uh, most importantly is compiling whatever research was found into an interview guide. Interview guide is a list or outline of the topics and questions that the oral historian wants to hear from the narrator. Coming ready for an interview with a succinct list of information and direction will ensure as smooth of an interview as it can be. Consent is one of the most important parts of conducting oral histories. Oral history is an important tool of getting individual collective memories of historic events, places, times, and experiences, and the interviewee is doing a favor by being part of the process. It's important to respect them and their time by making sure that they consent to all facets of the oral history process, from collection to deposition to analysis and publication. They're people and should be treated as such. So if an interviewee ever wants to retract their consent, that request should be respected. Um, a good way to establish trust and make sure that the interviewee is comfortable is by asking for consent before, during, and after an interview. Before each interview, I sent every interviewee a consent form in need of gift to read and sign. Then at the beginning of each interview, after I said the introduction, I asked them for their verbal consent to make sure that they're still okay with doing this. And finally, after the interview, I reminded them that if there's any issue or discomfort, the option to back out is completely viable. During the interview, silence is one of the most powerful communicators. It communicates interest from the oral historian and provides the narrator with the room to take their story in whatever direction they see fit. Interrupting the narrator to ask a follow-up question, for example, could knock them off their train of thought and cause them to withdraw. Staying quiet was really important for me. I even told some interviewees that silence would be an active part in the oral history and would often stay silent as they finished a thought, even if it was uncomfortable. Sometimes that uncomfortable silence was broken by the narrator reflecting or adding on to where they stopped. Other times it was just a good way to signify that they were actually done talking and we could move on. After a short while, that silence, at least for me, stopped being uncomfortable and allowed me to stay more attuned. One way I reminded myself to stay silent when I wanted to interject was to keep my hands occupied by holding a pen or sitting on. A lot of people tend to talk with their hands, but if the hands can't move, the urge to talk becomes restricted too. Going back to the interview guide I mentioned earlier, I always made a more specific one based on the general guide for the project. However, for every interview, I never stuck to it. Being adaptable is key for the movement of an interview. If the narrator reaches a question sooner than expected or goes in a direction that wasn't even considered by the oral historian, following that train of thought can lead to deeper memories being recalled. It shows the narrator the narrator that they're being listened to and that their story is valued. And finally, the types of questions that I asked most were open-ended questions. As opposed to closed-ended questions, open-ended questions let the narrator take control and take authorship of how their stories were gonna go. For example, if I wanted to find out about a place the narrator grew up in, I asked, can you tell me about growing up in wherever they grew up? 
This opens up a lot of avenues they could go down. And if I wanted them to elaborate on something, I would ask, can you tell me more about that? And that's not to say closed-ended questions aren't important. They support the structure of the story and can lead the narrator to an aspect of the story that they might not have even thought about. The project ended up diverting from its original hypothesis. Um, after the first few months, I was only able to get about four interviews from two interviewees and their photographs. I started conducting oral histories in late October with the age ranges set previously. But by January, I had to expand that age range to just 18 and older because I wasn't getting enough people to participate. By expanding that age range, the lens of post-collection analysis had to expand past the internet lens too. It was also at this point that I began asking interviewees to send me photographs from their past and or present that represented moments of isolation. They could also send photos that just represented important moments from their lives. But because isolation is the overarching theme, those were fewer. And because I started asking for photos, the project shifted to focusing on the connection between the image and oral history, especially during the process of photo elicitation. So far, and I think for at least just the paper, I'm capping it at 15. Um, there are 15 interviewees, seven that are 18 to 22 years old and eight that are uh, older. And I still have to conduct um, a couple more follow-up interviews. And once that's done, I'll begin working through the transcripts and breaking down my observations. I also have to finish the photo shoots as scheduling has been a prevailing issue for both me and my interviewees. But even though I still have a lot of analyzing to do, I've already noted how powerful the tool of photo elicitation can be. In many instances, when we got to the photo elicitation portion of the interview, I noticed the interviewee perked up and got visibly excited or at least more emotionally expressive. And for many of the photo elicitation portions, the memories that were generated either expanded a good amount on a previous topic of the session or opened up a whole new topic to talk about. And that's around so far. Um, I think I want to focus a lot more on um, the sensory part of oral history, which I think is really, really cool. Um, because in an interview, it's just you're talking and listening, it's already too, but then you focus on the visuals and like um, how deep that goes into a person's like everything. It's just really cool. And that's where I'm at so far. Thank you so much. Um, I, I I will uh, claim pride of um, ownership here, right? I mean, <laughs> this is, B is my student and, and we've worked together uh, for I guess three and a half years and, and this has been wonderful to watch. Um, B is, as uh, Professor Manzi has noted, very sophisticated um, and growingly so and breaking, I think, rel new ground with the use of, of the sensory information she's interested, they're interested in. Um, uh, B, let me ask you, what, uh, give me an example of when things don't go right in an interview. How do you handle yourself? How do you handle the interview? I think at least for my project, one of the biggest issues has been um, being online. Um, because of COVID, a lot of the interviews had to be online. I think only three ended up being in person. Um, but Zoom fatigue has been such a huge issue. Um, zoning out especially has been such a hard thing. And, you know, watching yourself on screen for some of the interviews went up to like three and a half, four hours at a time. And that's just, it's so hard to sit through. But to get around that, um, I noticed that actually I mentioned that photo elicitation, the portion of the interview, that was always at the end of the interview. And seeing them perk up after hours of just making them talk through their life and their experiences, which have some of them have been very like, you know, hard to listen to because it's a traumatic period in the times. Um, that's been really cool to watch because um, it changes the whole dynamic of the interview. They become interested again um, after all that time. Um, and also issues with being online, you know, Wi-Fi sucks for a lot of people, it can cut out. Um, which is always an issue. You know, it always cuts the flow of an interview. Um, and losing a, a focus also, you know, throws off where you wanted to ask them as your historian. It's not just on them, it's on you, on me to, you know, guide them and all that. So that has been, I think, the biggest issue. Thank you. Are there any other, anybody else would like to ask a question? I do think that, uh, as Professor King has said, um, the ethic of care is uh, at the center of, of your practice, and it, it matters a great deal. Um, uh, and Professor King, can you follow up on your comment in the chat? Um, I would like to hear more of what you mean and say. 
Sure. Yeah, no, I was just, um, I was really struck by, as I called it, the ethic of care, the amount of sometimes people rush over what you presented to us because they're because the interview is kind of the exciting part right and you really want to get to talk to people and in rushing over all of the the work the preparatory work that you did sometimes people can do harm but they can also do harm to their own project right because they rush in and then they realize oh wait i could have done this differently and actually gathered better information right um, and so I really appreciate, even though I'm not the only one, I'm sure who's like, oh, we don't get to see any pictures, we don't get to hear any quotes, but I appreciate that you're going through that process really carefully. And it just reminded me of the passion and care that the other two presenters um, also demonstrated for their subjects. So I'm not sure if that came up at all in class, kind of talking about wanting to do quality research, but also wanting to have care for whether it's octopuses or whether it's, um, you know, a kind of disappeared Jewish community and how that, it's, it's something that I think as researchers, we don't always talk about, but that many of us, it is very important to us and it is part of the process that sometimes people never see or read about. So. It's not exactly a formed question and it could be something that your, your colleagues might also want to chime in on, but I'm happy to hear if you have any response to that random comment. I'll just say that um, I think the most important part of the interview is that uh, the projects that dealing with actual people, um, as opposed to just you know, reading documents or looking at histories of you know, people who are not with us or, um, yeah. So, um, that was the most important part, just they're doing me a favor and I don't want to, you know, uh, make them any more uncomfortable that, than they might already be talking about something that could be, you know, very traumatic and triggering for them. Um, so yeah, putting them first before an interview, even if the interview didn't work out and they had to, you know, you know back out of the project, that was totally fine because at the end of the day, um, it's more about them than it is about me in that regard. I think that's a wonderful answer. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, um, move to our next presenter, not because the topic raised by Professor King isn't worth, <laughs> isn't worth its own seminar, um, because I think it is. Um, but we have several other students to hear from, and I'd like to turn the, the, the floor over to Adia Atherley. Um, another one of my students is a, a Macaulay student, a graduating senior, a history and secondary education major, and a teacher candidate, especially interested in new and interesting ways of learning and teaching history through different and non-traditional media. Um, Adia, I'm going to make you a co-host so that you can take over the screen if you care to do so. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, good afternoon. Well, no, it's not really afternoon, it's more evening. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think this is so interesting and it's my first time ever being on like a live stream ever. So that's something. Um, I'm just looking for the right tab. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, right. <laughs> my project was on the influence of pandemic and medical racism specifically during the period of time between like 1918, 1921. Next slide. Um, so this is really just like a very, very brief overview of what my project is because I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> and so essentially what I wanna focus on, I'm just gonna move the camera over. Okay. so. Uh, what I want to focus on are the um, housing conditions that Black people had to live in and near, and how that contributed to the many health crises like around the country, but particularly in the South of America, um, and the lack of properly funded medical facilities. Not just the lack of properly funded medical facilities, but also like the lack of medical facilities. Um, I also want to touch on the importance of Black newspapers and also just slightly unpack the concept of Black people being like being seen as disease spreaders by the majority of the white population at the time and a couple explanations for the lower 
a couple possible explanations for the lower influenza death rate for Black people during the pandemic. Okay, so I just wanted to start off with this excerpt from um, W.E.B. Du Bois in his study with um, the University of Atlanta, I believe, on um, Black housing and the conditions that Black people, particularly in Atlanta, had to live in and how that directly contributed to the poor health that was seen in the Black community at the time. And prior to the study, white health officials led everyone to believe that it was actually like some sort of genetic or um, biological difference that like Black people were genetically and biologically different. And that's why the health was so bad and not that the, the conditions played any part. When, especially in Atlanta, Black residential lots were the lots that white people didn't want because they were near like places that would collect rainwater and sewage and garbage. And basically like it's, it's the poor picking of the lot. And so because black people had to exist on the, oops, somebody is being admitted. Because black people had to uh, exist in this terrible condition, it, it directly related to the rise, especially in like respiratory diseases, that was seen a lot. There was like a very high rate of respiratory, uh, respiratory diseases and respiratory disease deaths. So um, there was a thing called like alley housing and um, it was sort of like the Southern version of like a tenement house because it was more, uh, not necessarily spread out, but it, was, it, it wasn't as, systematic, I guess, like there wasn't one particular building, like it was just throughout the land. Um, and a lot of the houses that were in these alleys looked like one room cabins with no siding, or if they had siding, it was like not full, um, unfinished boards, um, an open fireplace. Basically, it was just like a house crammed into one room where many, many people had to share. And um, the alleys were often referred to as nobody's alleys since they were too narrow for the city to claim as streets and therefore were not under any government's jurisdiction. So they didn't receive any city services. So sewage sort of uh, existed as a constant thing. <laughs> it was just like a, a bunch of sewage in people's backyards that they just had to deal with. And that would attract mosquitoes and the mosquitoes would then infect people with like malaria and other stuff. Um, I included some pictures of alley housing and you can kind of see sort of what it is. It looks like poorly constructed houses. Um, there's some more pictures. Um, the one on the top left is more of what they were describing, what uh, W. B. Du Bois was describing. And you can kind of see they're like extremely poorly constructed houses that are just sort of like mashed together. And some people really don't even have like proper walls and stuff. Um, also, black newspapers during the time of the influenza pandemic were extremely, even before and after that, but most especially during the pandemic, were extremely important because it was the only way for really for black people to uh, share the information around because white newspapers never really uh, wrote many articles about black people. And if they did, it was to further um, cement the racist, stereotypes that existed at the time and wouldn't ever really share anything important and not biased. So black newspapers, even if they were for a particular area, they would be used outside of that area as well to spread the information. And of course, literacy was not as widespread at the time in the black community. So um, uh, institutions like churches and other sort of um, verbal congregating places were also really important um, in conjunction with uh, black newspapers to keep everybody informed, especially 
when there was a pandemic occurring where you kind of needed to know things day by day and you had to stay um, up to date on what to do, what not to do and how to stay safe. Um, you, we saw like a community sort of um, fixes or like solutions that were just there because of the lack of um, knowledge lack of resources. There were home remedies that didn't work, but were used throughout the community. And it's mainly of like smelly things like onions and garlic that were like worn around the neck near the nose to sort of like try to get the thing to not come into their like respiratory system. Um, Black nurses and doctors were extremely busy. They were traveling constantly and there was a lack of them because of the, the need was so great. Um, black hospitals were extremely underfunded and were not plentiful. And the capacity was very small for the community that they were serving. Um, the black spaces in the white hospitals, which were better funded, um, more plentiful, were inhumane and were largely in areas, either the attics of hospitals where there was no heating or the basements of hospitals where there was no cooling. So it, it was a, sort of similar to the um, situation regarding black housing, which it's like the part that white people don't want basically. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company they uh, did a study of influenza deaths and basically it came back with um, that the black death rates for influenza were less than white people once the pandemic started. But before the pandemic started, they were higher. <clears throat> um, and there still isn't like one particular explanation that everyone just understands is the right one because there are so many factors and um, the cases were most likely underreported because of one, just racial bias, but also um, lack of proper health care for black people at the time. Um, there were a lot of like home visits that doctors would do, but because the number of black doctors was so few, um, not everyone could get a doctor. So there were most likely many people that died in their houses and that were sort of counted as something else rather than as like an influenza death. Um, one hypothesis suggests that black people were less susceptible to this specific type of influenza. Um, another one, which is quite racist, but I included anyway, just to show the point of the project sort of, um, is that uh, Black people were less susceptible to infections that enter through the body, through the upper respiratory tract, such as influenza and polio, because of the lining of their noses, and that they were more resistant to microorganisms, um, which we know is just not true. <laughs> uh, because of the such high uh, rates that Black people had of respiratory diseases prior to and during the influenza pandemic. Um, uh, an additional study analyzing the influenza rates between black and white soldiers concluded that African-Americans were not as susceptible to disease when they lived under good hygienic conditions, which could be true because of obviously good conditions would help fight the pandemic because, you know, cleanliness, but that was a problem because the conditions that black people normally had to live with were in segregated housing. So they were next to the poor conditions that would have continued to uh, ruin it, basically, ruin their health. Um, so another uh, hypothesis is that um, there, there was like a milder spring epidemic prior to the uh, like fall of like almost official start in the fall where like a bunch of people started dying and like it, it really became a pandemic at that point. Um, but the milder spring case, they believe that a lot of black people might have gotten it then and therefore they might have um, gotten some sort of immunity from that. So by the time that the fall epidemic really started, they already had some sort of immunity. Um, another <laughs> hypothesis is that uh, segregation, racial segregation was obviously uh, a thing at this point in American history and that might've helped 
prevent Black people from dying or at least catching the influenza as much as it would like. I, it wouldn't ravish the, uh, the Black community as much as it was the white community because of that, because there was obviously like legally enforced racial segregation. So there wasn't as much mingling. Um, another one was basically that, um, essentially, yes, the, the racial segregation, sorry, I, I read it twice. Um, Underreporting was definitely a possibility. And because um, a lot of people that died from the influenza died from things like pneumonia and other things. So, I mean, I mentioned it like previously, but I'll mention it again, just that like a lot of deaths most likely were reported as something other than influenza. And also that um, essentially like the, there's a lot of speculation around what the particular reason is for this, but genuinely uh, around the time and now, um, most people kind of understood that there was a less, um, there was a, a lower rate of death in the black community. So that's why it sort of continued into uh, the information that we have today, because the, uh, the black lay public, black physicians and white public health officials all shared that um, idea. And so these are three particular cases that I um, sort of studied and are included in my uh, thesis about um, basically about like the racist science and how bad it was for Black people at the time to even just receive medical care. Um, the Race Traits um, text by Frederick L. Hoffman essentially stated that the excessive mortality rates in African-Americans were due not in the conditions of life, but in race traits and tendencies. And that um, general intemperance, immortality, and congenial, sorry, immorality, <laughs> not immortality, um, general intemperance and congenital poverty were race traits. He argued that during slavery, Black people were healthy and disease-free, but that since emancipation, the colored race is shown to be on the downward grade, tending toward a condition in which matters will be worse than they are now. And the gradual extinction of the race take place, which is incredibly concerning um, because I believe this man worked for an insurance company at the time. Um, Dr. J. Madison Taylor, a white physician at Temple University Medical School in 1915, stated that black and white people had entirely different racial characteristics and that black people were susceptible to tuberculosis because they were structurally maladapted to live in Northern cities. Dr. Bernard Wolf, the president of the Board of Health in Atlanta blamed the high death rate on the fact that 40% of the population is comprised of Negroes with their notoriously unhygienic and insanitary modes of living and their established susceptibility to disease, especially of infant classes. He stated that the health department could not be held responsible for the high death rate among the black community because they lacked resistance and were unclean unlike the white citizens of Atlanta. Wolf only agreed to improve the horrible environments that the black communities in Atlanta had lived in because it affects the city's uh, reputation <laughs> while threatening the health of white persons. He almost completely disregarded the health of the black citizens of Atlanta because he believed that the race was marked for extermination by disease resulting from their contact with civilization. Um, this is an, uh, an excerpt from a racist white newspaper called the Atlanta Constitution, which argued against race, racial housing segregation because um, the disease germ knows no color or race line, no class distinction, and has little, res little respect for distance when it can fasten on a human carrier. Um, but continued to say that to purge the Negro of disease is not so much a kindness to the Negro himself as it is a matter of sheer self-preservation to the white man. So essentially they were arguing against racial housing segregation, but not for the reason that you would want them to argue against it. Because essentially they, um, they brought up that black people were going to enter white houses anyway, because they did uh, domestic work, like raising, like help, not raising, but nannying kids, uh, butlers, drivers, laundry, 
So they would have contact with white people anyway. So racial housing segregation wouldn't be the right thing to do to help stop the spread of influenza. Adia, two more minutes, I'm afraid. Uh, well, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, just some more excited from the uh, presentation. And um, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I apologize then. I didn't, I didn't know what I was saying. Um, uh, I, what you've done is highlight the, the, the racialized nature of medical science, a uh, 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 terribly painful um, episode. I would like to open the floor for questions uh, from the rest of you, my historians among us. Well, I'll, I can start um, if, if if that's okay. Um, can you connect what you're describing to a broader conversation about race and medicine um, that was circulating um, at the close of the 19th and into the early 20th century? Um, well, yes, because I know that my presentation mentioned like the influenza pandemic, but this was sort of the ra the reality for Black people just seeking medical care no matter what the issue was. Um, I talk about specifically in my thesis, um, black soldiers and the underreporting of um, venereal diseases because white doctors did not wanna have to touch them physically <laughs> and in close uh, proximity, and they didn't wanna be in close proximity to them. So it, it very much goes deeper than just the influenza pandemic. It, it was just like the way of life for black people seeking medical treatment. And there's still very much a medical bias against Black people even right now. So it, it's really, it was really interesting for me to see like how it changed or how it didn't change for Black people seeking medical care in America. Thank you, Adia, very much. The, the painful continuities of, of American life. Um, if anyone would care to answer, uh, ask a question, please do unmute yourself. Um, Nick, please go ahead. Yeah, not so much of a question. I didn't get to see your work cited page, but um, a book I read uh, this year, uh, Racecraft, also touches a lot upon um, the the ways in which Black people in America have been um, mistreated in medicine. Um, and uh, if, if you haven't read that book, it's 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 worth a read. Many thanks. We have two more presentations and I would like to um, pass on to them. Um, our next presenter is Micah Sander, is a, is a senior double majoring in history and television, radio and emerging media. He's the vice president of our uh, Brooklyn Historical Society and has worked on three seasons of the TV radio department's scripted web series, Unproductive, as an actor, writer and head writer. He plans to continue his education after graduating in the fall by pursuing a master's in international relations, global affairs, or world history. Um, uh, Micah, the floor belongs to you. I'll make you a co Thank you, Professor Napoli, for that introduction. Uh, let me share my screen, okay. Great, uh, everyone saw that, everyone sees this, all right. Uh, so my project, uh, pertains to uh, basically what makes Cuban military intervention in Southern Africa in the 70s and 1980s uh, unique in Cold War history. Uh, in doing so, I, I also seek to highlight Cuba's independence as a Cold War actor uh, and challenge this narrative that is often associated, that is often told in the Cold War of the uh, you know, bipolar uh, superpower uh, war that occurred, it was actually much messier and much more interconnected uh, than that. Uh, so I just wanna get right to it. So in 1975, uh, South Africa invaded Angola to intervene in the uh, civil war that was occurring. Angola had just achieved independence and there was a civil war between the communist MPLA and the nationalist uh, Western backed uh, UNITA and FNLA. Uh, South Africa could not accept a communist Angola because it was on the border with Namibia, which South Africa had been holding on to as essentially a colony since the end of World War I. 
uh, and apartheid had extended into Namibia as well. Uh, a communist Angola would also be bad because uh, it could support the ANC, which, we, which would be bad for uh, South Africa directly at home. So uh, South Africa essentially blitzed across the border in 1975 to take out the MPLA. But the MPLA uh, called out for help to the communist world and uh, Cuba responded by intervening as well and sending 40,000 soldiers uh, in an operation called Operation Carlotta. Uh, they're able to push out uh, the South Africans along with uh, the Angolan military and they end up staying until 1991. Uh, the conflict goes until 1988, uh, but the official withdrawal is 1991. And in that period, 430,000 Cubans will have served in Angola, uh, 377,000 of them as military personnel and the rest as aid workers and uh, technical experts. So this is like teachers, economists, uh, doctors. Uh, this is a massive presence of the Cubans in Angola, uh, which the Soviets were not thrilled about uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the Soviets feared that Cuban intervention in South Africa, in Southern Africa, uh, would spark a much larger war uh, because of, well, because of U.S. policy at the time. Uh, U.S. policy in the 1980s was increasingly uh, anti-communist uh, all across the globe, uh, and the lengths that it was going to uh, to fight communism. Uh, can really be exemplified by their support for uh, people like Jonas Savimbi, uh, who is the head of UNITA and was known for uh, torturing his opponents and killing people in his own group and killing civilians and just uh, some of the most horrific strongman characteristics. Uh, but so as you have the US supporting South Africa's uh, invasion of Angola uh, through covert means uh, and backing groups like UNITA, you also have the Soviet Union uh, basically pulling back internationally uh, in this period. The Soviet Union, for a number of reasons, is getting weaker and they just cannot get involved uh, like they used to. Uh, this is probably best exemplified by, uh, so the, the US had been threatening Cuba again with an invasion or an airstrikes uh, on the island of Cuba if they did not pull out of Africa or uh, and Central America. Uh, and when Cuba went to the Soviet Union to ask for help, basically they wanted a guarantee of defense that if America uh, hit them, that the Soviets would come to their aid. The Soviets basically said, we can't do that because we aren't able to. So you're on your own. If the US ever attacked you, you would be on your own. We can't get involved. Uh, but despite this, uh, Cuba continues to send its soldiers abroad. and. Uh, Instead of just defending Angola from South Africa, they doubled down on this much larger mission in the region, uh, which is to uh, free the region from South African dominance, which is basically trying to fill the voids that, uh, uh, that were created after the European uh, colonizers left. Uh, so free the region from South Africa and apartheid in, and uh, end apartheid within South Africa itself. Uh, this is what Fidel Castro called the most beautiful cause. Uh, so it expands from just defending this one communist government to liberating this entire region from colonialism. Uh, and uh, though the Soviets were not thrilled about this mission, they were, they were fearing that it could spark a larger war. They were heavily involved in the planning and strategizing of the whole thing. They sent military advisors. They didn't send soldiers into combat. The Cubans held uh, all of their people uh, in this major defensive line, sort of in the middle of the country that the South Africans never crossed. But this is tens of thousands of Cuban soldiers and not that many Soviets uh, basically uh, deciding how the whole war is going. And eventually uh, when the South Africans are pushing further and further north, closer to the defensive line, it looks like there's gonna be airstrikes on their line and the Cubans will be wiped out. Uh, Cuba has had enough of Soviet leadership, which has gotten them basically nowhere. Uh, they decide to essentially empty out everything they have back on the island, uh, which had been defending the island for a potential U.S. attack. Uh, so this is their best pilots, their best planes, tanks, uh, tens of thousands more soldiers are all sent across the Atlantic to Angola uh, to defeat South Africa. And uh, the Soviets are not asked or they're not informed. Uh, they're only told after Cuba has already started sending the soldiers. Uh, there's this 
narrative that, uh, which was pushed at the time and is still sort of believed that the Cubans were Soviet mercenaries. Uh, but here we have a direct example of where Cuba usurped Soviet uh, leadership in the region and just said, we're going to do things our way. And their way was in fact uh, better because they were able to uh, destroy South African air superiority in Angola, uh, eject the South Africans from the country, uh, which created a corridor into Namibia for Namibian freedom fighters to then enter there and uh, support resistance movements there. Uh, in general, uh, it provided a sort of, uh, provided a sort of hope, sort of a beacon for uh, the independence movements that have been going on in Namibia uh, and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. Um, and uh, the war eventually ends in 1988 with a Cuban Angolan victory over South Africa. The Cubans withdraw in 1991. Unfortunately, the Angolan civil war still continues until 2002, but uh, the Cubans were successful uh, in uh, kicking the South Africans out. Namibia then is uh, on the track for independence, which it does get and apartheid does collapse. Uh, but so why is this significant in Cold War history? Uh, basically, in the five kinds of Cold War conflicts I identified in researching this project, the Cuban-South African War is not fully encapsulated by any of these conflicts alone. Uh, the war involved pieces of all these types of conflicts, and I, I can't explain fully you know, every single reason uh, why this war is unique, but some of the biggest factors uh, include Cuba's specific anti-colonial internationalism and history with anti-imperialism, uh, South African apartheid and uh, South Africa's colonial legacy, uh, the racialized nature of the war, the fact that South Africa had nuclear weapons, and Cuba had proven to the world that it was ready to go to the brink in 1962. Uh, as I said before, the usurpation of Soviet military leadership in Angola by Cuba. Uh, just the fact that Cuba crossed an ocean with almost all of its military to get involved in a war that did not concern their own safety. Uh, and that Cuba did what the US and USSR could not in Vietnam or Afghanistan. Cuba went in with specific war aims, achieved them, and left in an orderly fashion once victory against South Africa was achieved. It also serves as an example of a different way to understand the Cold War. The superpower perspective of the Cold War world as simply a bipolar world blinds us to the reality that many countries acted against superpower interests and use the US and USSR to further their own national goals. So while Cuba is defying the USSR and still getting aid, South Africa is doing the same with the United States. Uh, the concept of proxy wars can often be misleading because it implies that every Cold War conflict had something to do with the US and USSR. And it, it takes this, put it sort of simply this top down approach instead of I can't think of a better phrase, but a, instead of a bottom up approach, you know, what does it do to our understanding of the Cold War to look at things as, you know, why did, why was Cuba there in, outside of communism? Let's detach Cuba from the Soviet Union. What were the other motivating factors? You know, let's detach South Africa's uh, reasoning that they didn't want communists around. Let's detach uh, their own reasoning from this larger Cold War narrative of pitting the two superpowers against each other. Uh, because we, we can really miss a lot when we just, uh, adhere to that one overarching narrative. Here are just a few memes that I found uh, that in my research that I enjoyed. Um, and uh, this is what I will leave you with. Uh, thank you. Micah, thank you so much for, for um, reminding us uh, that nations don't necessarily act in accordance with uh, preconceived narratives. They have their own uh, rationales. There's been an active conversation in the chat that you haven't seen, and as a consequence, I wouldn't mind it if uh, our colleagues would step in and ask some questions. Professor King and Professor Gould wanted to make points, I think, and ask questions. Well, uh, I think the the tracing the tracing of the revolution. I mean, the revolution ideologically was very overt about tracing its origins to early slave rebellions and spent a lot of money building monuments to, to slave rebellions. 
Um, and so really elevated its Afro-Cubanness as part of its internationalist decolonizing, you know, mission. Um, and so, you know, that its support for SWAPO um, and, you know, its, its work elsewhere in the world, its military and medical work, you know, the two things it sent all over the world, you know, is, is really rooted in that. So, I mean, the, the Cuban revolution has, a, has an ideology that is separate and distinct from that of, of Soviet Bolshevism. Completely, completely, but it's uh, totally ignored. And you look at the policy papers and what the presidents are saying all throughout the later part of the Cold War, they cannot think of Cuba as an independent people, country separate from the Soviet Union. They just believe all of a sudden that history started in Cuba in 1959 and they're all communists. Uh, and uh, as I said, it, you miss a lot when you only approach it from that. Yeah, I mean, especially when you look at the early, that, that early phase of the revolution where, you know, where uh, Castro and Che and, and Cienfuegos did, didn't really know what to do with the Russians when they showed right, up. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and there's so much uh, where there's a little bit of disdain for the Soviets as well. There's an acknowledgement that, you know, they are imperialists too, you know, and we are just getting what we need from them, but uh, we're gonna go our own way. It's great. Great work. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Micah. Um, I would like to turn to our next and final presenter, Nick Merrick. Um, Nick is a graduating senior majoring in history and anthropology. He has a passion for Eastern uh, European history and music, and he hopes to express professionally at some point in his career. I do need to say, Nick is a uh, um, uh, 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 recipient of, um, uh, of, of, of Fulbright to uh, to Moldova, right, Nick? Uh, yeah, I, I am. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, do you guys see the PowerPoint fine? All right, great. So, um, homemade Soviet champs. It's a bit of a misnomer, but hopefully we'll get over that. Um, so today it's pretty easy for one to acquaint themselves with stereotypical Russian music through something as simple as a Google search. Uh, you are bound to come across some variation of a video which attempts to inform you of the names of some familiar Russian melodies, the curation of which tends to be very consistent. Um, a balanced mix of traditional folk melodies, classical compositions, and perhaps a few Soviet anthems or war songs sprinkled in for good measure. And if you put these melodies into a timeline such as this one, a queer paradigm emerges. Nothing written after 1938 appears in the catalog. You can observe a single exception, and that would be what is colloquially referred to as uh, the troll song, uh, of which a recording by Edward Hill exists uh, from 1976 and was rediscovered and then promptly turned into an internet meme uh, between the years 2009 and 2010. But even still, uh, this rediscovery was only made possible two, uh, two decades after the end of the Cold War a fact which could easily lead you to think that the Iron Curtain did an efficient job of isolating the Eastern Bloc from Western Europe and the United States. Uh, however, I would say that this isn't exactly the case. And while, um, while Western music had a significant impact on the development of Soviet genres, uh, those both states sponsored and not, uh, so, uh, it should come as no surprise to anyone here today that the infrastructure surrounding the development of art in the Soviet Union differed drastically from its Western counterparts. Any official artist within the Soviet Union inherently worked for the government and was thus chosen by the government to do so. In order to get in, typically a Soviet citizen would start young, attending an art school or conservatory, creating a social network and earning government contracts Public recognition was not the key to making it as an artist. Government recognition was, and maybe if you really were worth it, uh, public recognition would come subsequently. So how about those artists who were able to garner recognition from the public, but not from the government? As you can probably tell, this system creates the foundation for a contradiction. The Soviet project prided itself on its progressive ideals, ideals which found their expression in the Soviet avant-garde of the 1920s, the progressive literature of feminists such as Alexandra Kollontai and other works of culture, which pushed past the norms of the day 
and fueled the utopian dreams of the future that the communist ideology is predicated on. And yet, while this was the Soviet Union's revolutionary pride, it was far from its reality. The Soviet regime's maniacal obsession with censorship and heavily centralized state control over cultural production conflicted quite obtusely with its craving for new progressive cultural works. What we have here is what Alexei Yurchak would call Leffert's paradox, where the Soviet leadership is in constant anxiety about publicly justifying its firm grasp on cultural production while simultaneously attempting to promote experimentation and independence for the sake of cultural progress. And try to keep this uh, paradox in mind as it will become a bit important later. So for now, let's talk about the home, which is you know, the second half of where this presentation gets its name. Uh, the Soviet government's attempts at gatekeeping culture could only go so far. And inadvertently, it helped to spawn one of several genres which adopted to the state-restricted environment, a seed nurtured by the egg of the home. The late 1950s and 60s saw a rapid expansion of housing in the USSR. According to one calculation between 1956 and 1970, over 126 million Soviet citizens, that's, over, uh, that's more than half the country, uh, moved into new housing made possible in large part by the manufactured apartment buildings, the infamous Khrushchevas, which you now see marching across the screen. Uh, the combination of these private spaces, guitars and poetry in the hands of amateur musicians created a force difficult to stop. It was now possible to create music which was hidden from the scrutiny of the state. Guitar poetry and author songs are just two of the popular names for a genre I will refer to throughout this presentation as bard music. So we'll begin with the Romantic era, which is an epoch and harmonic to the space age. It took place around the 1950s and 60s. And as you might imagine, it's an era characterized by romantic ideals and intense emotions. The early post-Soviet years were those of hope and dreams, perhaps a chance to start fresh after the terror of the 1930s and the further tragedy ushered in by the Second World War. Writer, writers such as Alexander Galich, Bulat Akudrava, and Yuri Blisber were in many regards the pioneers of bard music. And all, all three of these men are pictured on the screen. Um, uh, but let's take a, close, a closer look at uh, my favorite of the three, uh, shown in the top left corner, Bulat Akudrava. Just to quickly emphasize um, the cultural significance and popularity of his poetry. The man got a minor planet named after him. And his music is also featured in a classic Soviet film, which is ritually watched by astronauts before every voyage into space. So I thought that these were um, a couple interesting facts about, uh, I guess, the cultural significance of Bulata Kudrava's music. Unfortunately, I had to cut out most of his biography for the sake of brevity. But for now, we'll move on to the next era of Soviet bard music, which takes place in the 1970s and uh, by the start of which any revolutionary fervor present in the Soviet ideology had been extinguished by an aging leadership. And the apparent economic stagnation and blatant indulgence of party leaders in luxuries not acceptable to the general public was reflected in the next epoch of bard music, the ironic era. And no longer did communism appear to be just around the corner. And the decline of this revolutionary sentiment was in blatant contradiction to the Soviet Union's progressive origins. It became more and more apparent that the state's agenda was not necessarily in line with the interests of the people. Uh, what Melodia, Melodia being the, um, the state's record labor, re record label, sorry, um, there was only one record label in the Soviet Union, that being Melodia. Uh, so what Melodia considered to be hip and new did not necessarily correspond to what music was actually popular at the time. If you wanted to know what was really hip, I'd recommend Googling a man named Vladimir Vysotsky, who uh, was a, a professional actor in the Soviet Union, but was in my, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was far better known as a bard singer or performer rather, uh, and his... Um, his music and poetry is, is, is very significant in, in, um, in, I suppose, even, you know, the contemporary Soviet memory. Um, but just know that the music of this time period was characterized by a satire 
of the contradictory Soviet milieu. Uh, case in point provided by the 1976 film, Irony of Fate, or Enjoy Your Bath, as it goes by its second name, uh, which is a New Year's film, and it has aired on Russian television every December 31st since its release. I, however, am more, most concerned with the music laden within it. Irony of Fate features nine distinct poems performed as bard songs by primary characters all throughout the film. Many, if not the majority of these poems, were banned in the USSR, having been written by alleged class enemies and other victims of the 1930s purges. And their addition to this film was vital in providing an authentic portrayal of the Soviet home. Beyond that, the melancholy lyrics of many of these bard songs creates a stark contrast to the otherwise ironically comedic plot. Uh, it actually happens to be the film from which I pulled the animated clip in, um, in the slide with, uh, you know, with the marching buildings. Um, it's a good film. I would recommend it. It's on, up on YouTube for free with, with English subtitles. And it is, uh, you know, a, a cultural icon of, of uh, I guess, Soviet, Soviet cinematic history. Uh, moving on. Wait, yeah, making sure. Yes, touched on all the points. Great. So moving on. Uh, something that has been omitted from the presentation thus far is mention of another underground genre which developed alongside bard music in the 1960s, that being the Soviet rock scene. In 1978, student protests in Georgia regarding the russification of Georgia's official language policy would result in a step back and a moment of reflection on behalf of the Soviet government. And the question here was the same. How do you maintain a centralized authority while supporting progress and independence? a nod back at the previously mentioned Leffert's paradox. The answer to this paradox would come two years later in the form of the Tbilisi Rock Festival, otherwise known as Spring Rhythms 1980. This would be the first sanctioned rock festival in the USSR and would be a beautiful event for a multitude of reasons. Here we have a clear devolution of power from the Soviet gerontocracy to the experimental and progressive Soviet youth in large part thanks to the first secretary of the Georgian Communist Party, Edward Shevardnadze, who would later become famous for completely different reasons, um, but who at the time was a major reformist. And this festival would gather a diverse catalog of musical groups, magnetic band from Estonia, uh, Gunesh from Turkmenistan, and an even greater number of bands from Russia and Georgia. Their repertoire also ranged in genre, many putting a modern twist on national folk songs, experimental jazz fusion, and progressive rock. This was more than just a rock festival. It was a unique musical encounter between peoples who were otherwise isolated and growing apart. People who in 10 years time would find themselves separated by international borders. I could not conclude this presentation without the mention of one final bard whose untimely death sentenced his art to relative obscurity. And this is Alexander Mikhailovich Litvinov, better known as Venya Durkin. Uh, and he is someone I regard as the last Soviet poet. Through his music, Litvinov depicts in sardonic fashion the lived experience of his generation in the final years of the socialist bloc. The raw vulgarity of his nonetheless sophisticated lyrics gave the Soviet subculture a final gasp of fresh air. There's no clear consensus on the, the classification of Vienna's music, while its minimalist acoustic instrumentation, guitar and voice, make it a candidate for bard music, its aggressive intensity gives it traits more congruent to rock. Thus, bard rock is the commonly given nomenclature to Vienna's novel musical genre. However, popular scholarly opinion prefers post-rock as the proper identification for his legacy. And this is because Vienna's music marks the beginning of a new era, both cultural and political. Distinct from the mark left by his rocking predecessors, Vienna effectively brings together the eclectic traits of all previously discussed Soviet subcultures. His lexicon includes slang developed from English words and the themes of his poetry, accompanied by equally complex music, unafraid to venture into dissonant extremes, combines to create art with a novel postmodern flavor. It was in the early 19, uh, 1990s that Vienna began 
uh, gaining prominence, but fame was something that would only arrive posthumously, as cancer would prevent our hero from surviving into the 20th century. Before his untimely device, uh, Vienna managed to write over 300 songs, which he performed in then Soviet, now post Soviet homes. Today, several of his recorded Kvartirniki are available to view for free on YouTube. In them, you can see the warm, cozy tones of crammed, domestic of crammed domestic spaces, an artist seated on the floor with nothing but his voice and guitar. All of this testimony to the irrelevance of material luxury and the development of good art. Like your grandma making you her signature jam, the close proximity between art, artist and idea create a magnetic intimacy a connection which we all insatiably crave and which no government can censor. Thank you. Fantastic, Nick. Thank you for, for highlighting the connection, the deep connection between culture and politics in the, in the Cold War era. Uh, I'd like to uh, open the floor. Professor Gottlieb, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Actually, this was very nostalgic for me because I grew up with irony of fate. My parents kind of raised me on it. Um, and I was wondering in your research, um, if you uh, studied the group Aquarium with Boris Gudenshikov. Oh, with, yes. Yeah, so because they were, they were basically the first Soviet rock band. Yeah, so uh, I had to omit Aquarium from the presentation for, for obvious reasons. Didn't want to go over like 10 minutes. But um, but they were actually present at this this uh, rock festival, which I mentioned, the Tbilisi Rock Festival, Spring Rhythms. And they have a very interesting story. They were actually disqualified from the competition um, because of quote unquote homosexual demonstration. Um, and so they, they, um, they, they had to do a lot of convincing um, in order not to get kicked out of the festival altogether. Um, but they were eventually actually forgiven and given a second venue in Georgia just for them. Um, uh, but I forget the name of it. Um, but yeah, Aquarium, very big group. Um, I guess they're kind of considered punk rock, but when you think of punk rock, it's not the same kind of punk rock that you associate in the West. It's really just um, kind of I guess more dark themed. Uh, their inspiration is like, I, I remember watching an interview that they had with uh, uh, Andre Tro Troitsky. Um, and uh, they said that one of their inspirations was the Grateful Dead. So I think that, yeah. Right, sure спасибо. Пожалуйста. Well, folks, um, unless there are, are there any other comments or questions? It is cr creeping up on 9 p.m. We've had a, a wonderful day of presentations. Um, I'm, I'm going to call our evening to a, to a halt. I'm going to say thanks to all of our fabulous student presenters. Um, I've, I feel like I've, I've had a tour of the kinds of work that gets done across HSS, and I think that's a, exactly the purpose of this expo. I thank uh, Dean Gould and his team for arranging it, um, for our audience for, for, for attending. And once again, uh, much, much applause to the students. Thank you so much. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>